Welcome to the Petrosica podcast. I'm your host today, Mark Bilby. I'm going to be talking about the new release of my open gospel, first gospel, Laudlib, linked open data, living informational book, version six. It's Sunday uh, for me. Researching the gospels using a scientific approach is church. Uh, the latest update has about a half million words in it which is comparable to what it was previously. I had, had many data sets that were part of this. Those data sets have been published in the Journal of Open Humanities data, sometimes with uh, various collaborators. We're probably gonna have more coming out in the not too distant future uh, in collaboration with Marcus Vincent. Uh, but today's version of uh, what I call the first gospel lod lib is now available. It's version 4.06. I finally got through with uh, breaking it all out into separate volumes. Um, it was getting unwieldy because it was such a massive book. Uh, I needed to break it apart into various volumes. Uh, essentially, uh, volume one is the introduction and would fit on like normal book, uh, book pages size. Uh, but volumes two and three have huge, like 11 by 17 layout because the amount of data that you have to deal with and um, trace in terms of an evolutionary model or a cascading model uh, is is so vast and complex that it just requires a much larger page format than a traditional academic book and religious studies would involve. Uh, other volumes are sized according to what uh, contents they have in there. Um, so I have updates about all that stuff on my Patreon if you want to look at that and see what the rationale was for dividing the book this way. Uh, but essentially now we have six volumes. One volume is brand new uh, in terms of being released. This is a volume that I largely put together in 2000 and 2000, I'm sorry, 2020 and 2021 um, as I went through all the attestations to Marcion's gospel and uh, then just provided fresh translations. So I looked in the primary source text, not just relying on Dieter Roth's work, although that's an excellent work in terms of gathering the attestations. I went to the sources myself, confirmed page, updated. There were various places where Roth made mistakes in terms of the transcription of the Latin or the Greek text. I corrected those, but as a, a move toward accessibility and just analysis, I translated those. So most of those translations are already available in the footnotes of my main work um, in the big like synopsis uh, with the side-by-side -side gospels. I, in the footnotes to those, I very carefully, meticulously curated attestations, commentary, statistical analysis, this kind of stuff. But if you wanna just look at the attestations, and, and that's all, and you want a nice, like cleanly organized place to get at those, you can now look at those in volume six. <clears throat> Again, all this stuff is open access. Um, just something I believe very strongly in is open science, open data, open and transparent research. Uh, if research is being done behind a paywall, it's probably not reliable or trustworthy research. If classes are being offered behind a paywall, probably not reliable, trustworthy classes if they're hiding that stuff from the public and from other scholars um, you know you don't know where those sources come from you don't know uh, where you know the material comes from you don't know what is by that scholar and what is taken from other scholars maybe without credit so i just encourage people to be very strong advocates for open access and transparency and scholarship um, because otherwise you're running the risk of being hoodwinked uh, by people who are using religious studies as a grift and a way to make money off of you instead of just advancing the scientific discourse. Unfortunately, a lot of religious studies is geared to make a lot of profits for a very few amount of people. And uh, that's just not how it should be, um, particularly texts that are about Jesus being a poor slave, which is probably what the earliest gospel was all about. So I think it is dishonoring to scholarship and it is dishonoring to the, the very origins of Christianity to turn it into um, you know, a, a grift. So uh, this is open access. Uh, let's start going through uh, what's new to this. Uh, so I mentioned the attestations. I'll, I'll go ahead and bring those up so you can take a look at those. Um, here we go. Here's like sample page of attestations. 
where you can go through, see what the Latin text is, get the exact page number. Lots of abbreviations here may not be familiar to, to people unless you're scholars. SC is source chrétienne, which is a dual Greek or Latin French uh, critical edition of the text. Evans is Ernest Evans, who did a, a major version of um, Tertullian's um, commentary against Marcion. Uh, Epiphanes is Panarion. You know, if you start looking into these, you can figure out. And I have other resources and other places in the book where um, you can get at this kind of stuff. So I hope that that's useful to you. And then some, also just some. Uh, I've I've annotated this throughout. Uh, I have a list of witnesses here just to show that we have over twenty different witnesses to Marcion's Gospel. I also have these like little symbols and abbreviations I use to indicate what the significance is of a various, uh, you know, of, of a given attestation, whether it has a significant variant or not, whether that variant actually makes any difference to the restoration or not. So all of this is, is very meticulously researched and I just want to surface this stuff. This is a text I, for example, shared with Badoon. I don't know that he used it when he was putting his final revisions on the Greek edition of Marcin's gospel that we did together, but it was an, a text, uh, a resource that I shared with him back in the day. Uh, about a year and a half or two years ago. All right, uh, for the the intro, this is, you know, you could read through this, but now there's a separate table of contents for every volume of the book. So it just makes it a lot cleaner, easier to, to download, smaller files for each volume, all those kinds of things. So I want this to be maximally useful and usable, accessible. Um, so again, most of this stuff has been out here for four years. Uh, this is not new stuff. And, you know, I think it started to have a pretty significant impact on scholarship. Um, and I just want to put that invitation out there again for scholars to peer review this work. Uh, you know, my, some of my colleagues have certainly used this, cited this work, um, written, you know, brief reviews, but I would love for serious scholarly engagement with this work and collaboration. Tell me where I'm right. Tell me where I'm wrong. Uh, or be a part of this book this as this kind of a movement, an open science movement, and contribute. Maybe you want to take a chapter of Marcin's Gospel and do the translations for it. Um, you know, maybe you want to disagree and come up with a different model uh, for these texts. But I think uh, as opposed to 99% of prior gospel scholarship have actually got a viable scientific-based solution to the synoptic problem. Um, people like Goodacre or Kloppenberg, they only got it about 20% right. They were Their modeling was about 80% wrong and 20% right. This is the first time in history that scholars are close to an 85 to 90% correct modeling of the gospel in terms of modeling data flow, uh, which should be what this is all about. But unfortunately, most scholarship is just about like regurgitating mythical authorship and uh, just non-viable models that are simplistic flowcharts rather than truly evolutionary or cascading models uh, of the Gospels. Uh, these texts as signals and tracing the process of signal transmission and signal synthesis. Uh, let me bring open... Yeah, uh, I just thought I'd uh, show some of the new stuff. So um, I have fresh English translations now of everything in Chapter 4. There's quite a bit of Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 that are also have full English translations alongside the Greek. Scholars looking at the stuff have to analyze the Greek. You can't start from the English text and derive a serious uh, scientific analysis of this. The only way uh, to do a serious uh, scientific approach to these texts is, is to research them in their original languages. It's unfortunate that the classics are disappearing from most schools, most universities now. A lot of people might not have the tools to learn this, but there are various ways that you can learn and become more competent with Greek, but uh, I provide this dual language, Greek and English, <coughs> as well as, you know, when there are Latin attestations and Syriac attestations, I provide those in the footnotes. But this is a nice passage, uh, you know, to show another sort of data flow, correct data flow modeling of these relationships. Again, traditional models would say, you know, like mark and priority, you know, maybe Mark's first and Luke is second, Matthew's third, or Mark is first. Uh, Matthew is second, Luke is third, or Luke and Matthew are independent, but they use Mark and Q. All of those models just fail to do justice to a passage like this, where almost certainly the first tradition that we have is in Luke, but it's not in Marcion's version of Luke. So this is probably a late tradition 
and it's part of the restoration of Peter. And we see when we read various texts, including John probably in its first edition, uh, but also the other, t other texts, early version of Mark, early version of Matthew, early version of Luke, there's a lot of negative characterization of Peter. And in later versions, uh, there's a redemption of Peter. There's an attempt to try to make Peter look better or look like he was restored and wasn't just the one who betrayed Jesus and so on. And part of this redemp redemption of Peter, uh, recharacterization of Peter in the later traditions is part of a proto-Orthodox proto move. So uh, late Luke or Luke 2, LK2 as I call it, because I use... I use these abbreviations as basically scientific terminology rather than hagiographical mythical terminology for these texts. Um, it, it gives basically the simplest form. Uh, there are a few details in canonical Luke that don't occur in Matthew and Mark, but by and large, most of the stuff reoccurs. Um, so, you know, a general rule for tracing signals in the gospels is to look for elements that are unique and not present in the others. You know, like if you if you just shuffled these in a deck and you took the names off, how you know how would you determine which comes first, second, and third? You can compare Luke and Matthew and see commonalities, distinctive commonalities between them. You can compare Matthew and Mark and see distinctive commonalities between them. You can compare Luke and Mark and see distinctive commonalities between them. So is this just you know a head a head game? Is this just um, you know, an unsolvable mystery. No, it's not. It's actually not that complicated. Scholars just make it ridiculously overcomplicated. I know this looks complicated, but this is actually uh, an enormous uh, way of simplifying the problem just by looking at this in, in terms of pure data flow. Again, taking, taking the labels off, how would you trace the signals here? And if you look carefully and do a word by word comparison, you see certain elements that are only in Mark and not available in Luke and Matthew. So if you're going to say Mark and priority, then wh why did they just skip immediately and coming out that, that participle? And then this list of the three disciples, Andrew and Jacob and John, and approaching, and then the word immediately again, and the word grasping. So all those elements are not in Matthew and Luke. So you have to, in this in that scenario of Mark and priority, you have to have some kind of explanation where Matthew and Luke both happen coincidentally to just skip over all the same words when they see immediately neither one of them likes that word when they see the three extra disciples they don't like that so they skip that they skip the word immediately twice they skip the word approaching they skip the word grasping so mark and priority here is honestly ridiculous the far hypothesis good acre it's just foolishness it's garbage um the these are additional new traditions and they're clearly elaborations adding three more characters to the narrative. Again, an unbiased person who's not starting with a hagiographical model of these texts is going to say, yeah, this probably came in later. This, this is reminiscent somewhat of the transfiguration by adding three extra witnesses and as named disciples. Um, but there's more than that. And, and this word, the synthesis model, kind of a Hegelian model of uh, mapping data flow comes in because not only are there unique elements held in common between Luke and Mark, uh, sometimes it's you know the precise case of the word, like tes synagogues. That's a precise parallel between Luke and Mark. That's not in Matthew, so that has to be explained somehow. Uh, into the house of Simon, that is a precise parallel between Luke and Mark. That's not in Matthew. It's partly in Matthew, into the house, but Matthew renames the the, the main character here Peter rather than Simon. So in some ways, Mark is closer to Luke, but then in some ways, Mark is closer to Matthew. Um, so the, the participle here being fevered, which in Greek is pure uh, susa, right here, there is no participle for that in Luke. It does have the word pureto, which is fever, but it doesn't have a participial form of it. It doesn't like personify um, or it doesn't, it doesn't characterize the condition uh, using a more elaborate form, pure susan here in Matthew. So Matthew is a more elaborate, more complex, more grammatically sophisticated way of talking about this disease. It's part of even like a participial chain here that looks like it's new and like it's a modification. Um, and then in, Ma in Mark, it's, it's uh, modified 
uh, from uh, an accusative to um, a nominative, uh, but that's a unique linkage between Mark and Matthew. And we have several other things as well that are like that, like the word raise. Um, in Luke, Jesus rises, but he doesn't raise the woman. But in Matthew, he touches the hand of hers, and then she is raised in a passive form. But in Mark, there's kind of an amplification. One might say a Christological heightening because Jesus entering raises her. So it almost takes on a, a resurrection kind of significance that might be reminiscent of the story of Lazarus, uh, the raising of Lazarus, which might have been before this. Uh, grasping the hand, that's a new participle. It's a new concept. Um, there's no focus on the hand of the woman at all in Luke, but there is in Matthew. Jesus touched her hand, but in Mark, Jesus grasps her hand. It's a more and like more sophisticated, more elaborate, more thoughtful construction um, in terms of participial chaining going on here. And um, and then we have uh, the fever kind of being personified uh, in a way, like the fever does things. In Luke, Jesus censures the fever. He like rebukes it, um, maybe in a passive sense. Maybe it has a, like a demonic sense. Um, but in Matthew and Mark, the fever becomes personified. It actually does things. So the fever leaves her. It takes on the nominative form. Um, and and what you see throughout here, the being fevered, the raised, the, the mention of the hand, these are all elements in Matthew that aren't in Luke. But what, what you see when you put these things side by side and you just map every single word is that you have a synthesis in Mark here. You have a synthesis of Luke, Luke and material and Matthean uh, material that's combined, smushed together, and, uh, and reworked. That's the most sensible, the most logical, the most natural uh, way of mapping this data. So um, that's, that's the new English translation of this text. There are various others that we, we could look at here, but I'll just hold that up as a, oops, <coughs> excuse me, as a good example of that particular, um, you know, a data flow pattern of from going from Luke to Matthew to Mark. Again, straight contradictory to the way most scholars have approached those texts through the years. That would be a very minority position in scholarship. But if you don't start with the assumption that these were one-off texts, if you look at each one as its own as a, a multi-stage text that's evolving through the years, then we can be open to these more complex scenarios. Here's another one that's somewhat comparable um, about John being John the Baptist being imprisoned and died. If you look at the traditions about John in, as it relates to John being in prison, in the Gospel of John, it's very, very simplistic. Marcion's text has nothing about John. Uh, it does have John speaking from prison, but there's no elaborate story about why he gets thrown in prison or what happens to him when after he's thrown in prison or you know, how he gets executed. Um, but in John, so in John, there's, there's a brief reference to, G, to John being in prison, um, but in Luke, there's a much more elaborate story. Again, this part of the canonical form of Luke and Acts, which is much more concerned with like characterization, elaboration, political intrigue and drama, all of this. And then in Matthew, we have an expansion of that uh, where there's even more details. Uh, now we have uh, direct quotations being added to the story. Uh, we have elaboration of family relationships that were not in Luke. And then Mark finally in here, this again goes together with observations that Vincent has made for decades really about Mark maybe being the last gospel. It's not always the last gospel, but in many cases, Mark has the last tradition. It's the most elaborate. It's the most um, involved and it's the most synthesized. Again, merging elements and recombining elements that are distinctive to Luke and Matthew and making a new synthesis. Uh, that's what we see in Mark again here. So th this is kind of a similar thing to what we saw before. But if we go on to the story of the execution of John, there's nothing in Luke. So while Luke you know, tr tends to be very, very uh, interested in court drama, in political intrigue, in elaborate backstories, all this kind of stuff that you find in like the nativity or in the trial of Jesus, it's quite elaborate. Uh, here, the, we're probably looking at quite late traditions mm -hmm. 
of the death of John the Baptist. So the idea that Mark here is the earliest text is just absurd. It has an enormously expanded, highly involved, highly meticulous, but again, with tons of material, tons of elements that are not in Matthew. And again, like the problem with the whole idea of Mark and priority is you have to, you have to from that construct the idea that Matthew was an abridgment or that Luke was an abridgment, but there's no abridgment here. So your, your explanation is that Luke, a text that loves backstories, political intrigue, drama, all of this stuff, decided and and even had a story of uh, the beginning of John the Baptist, decided to leave out the story, elaborate, like amazing story of the, of the death of John the Baptist. Um, and even explaining Matthew as an abridgment of Mark here does not make sense because it doesn't read as a distillation. It reads as a different story. It just has... Uh, it has a different framework. It has a simpler framework. Um, and Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark is just far more involved, adding far more characterization, um, much more intrigue, more characters, um, circumstances, political terminology, right? All this stuff that, uh, yeah, if you're just copying a text, uh, and, and then things like even haste, these are things we find in canonical Luke. So it may even be here that this portion of Mark was redacted by the editor of Canonical Luke, right? Uh, or by a close associate of that person who liked this kind of court elabor uh, elaboratization because things like haste, that's a very common uh, narrative technique in Canonical Luke, but we don't find it here in the story in Luke. Instead, we find it in Mark. So we, it may be here that canonical mark is actually being edited by the same person or one of the, you know a group of people that includes um, a person or just somebody who's been influenced by the storytelling that you find in canonical luke where there's this constant emphasis on haste uh and court drama and all these kinds of things so uh so that's more uh those of you who are interested again in um in reading this in english please please enjoy those who would be interested potentially in collaborating with our team uh please reach out and um, if you would like to, again, write a review or give some critical feedback on any part of this, all of it is open to correction. It's an iterative work, so it can always be improved. There are plenty of mistakes uh, in here and plenty of things that need to be corrected. Um, but overall, this is probably the most significant and substantive work on the Gospels that you will be able to read or find in existence today. And I think it charts and pioneers a new path uh, for how we understand and analyze these texts. And there are going to be pretenders and derivatives uh, that are pretending to do work that is this meticulous and involved and serious and scientific, but um, there's just nobody yet who's done this. So uh, bring it on, you know, for the scholars out there, bring it on. That's all I got for today. I hope you have a good weekend. Peace out.